Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Do you have a right understanding of the living God, the God of the Bible? Most people do not. But here's the most disappointing news. Most believers do not. They too share the common thought that God is some nice old man type, that although he's holy and righteous, he's also abundantly forgiving and will always find a way to forgive. He will always offer forth his grace and those who deserve his judgment in the end, will not receive it. This is a false view of God. There is indeed a judgment day. And what the scripture reveals, in fact, what Yeshua taught, is the vast majority of humanity is not going to experience salvation, will not be in the kingdom of God, but will encounter God's eternal wrath, his everlasting punishment. Now, we share this frequently for two main reasons. One is when we read the scripture, and we don't just simply pick out what we want to share, but we go through the books of the Bible in the order of the chapters we find both in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. There is consistently a revelation of God's judgment. The Word of God speaks to a God who will pour out His wrath upon this world. We need to acknowledge that and we need to respond to that reality. And what is the best way to respond? Through repentance. Now, the second reason that we speak frequently about God's judgment is not only because the Bible does, but because we don't want anyone to experience that wrath. We don't want them to be consumed and placed into eternal punishment. We want them to repent. We want them to receive God's forgiveness by the blood of Messiah Yeshua and be a member of God's eternal family in the kingdom of God. And we believe the best way to achieve both of those goals is to accurately share the word of God. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 34. The book of Isaiah and chapter 34. Now, even though that there are a couple places in this 34th chapter that the language, the vocabulary and such is difficult, for the most part, 34th chapter of Isaiah is not a difficult chapter to read in the original language nor to understand. Sometimes it's a bit choppy and maybe not as smooth in in our understanding and how we would voice it. But nevertheless, the Hebrew is most clear, very discernible to understand what is the message from God through Isaiah in this 34th chapter. So look with me to verse 1. Now, there's going to be an emphasis upon the world. Why? Because it's the world that's going to experience God's judgment. They are going to be the recipients of God's wrath. So once again, God is revealing this ahead of time in order that people can make 
the necessary preparations. And again, the only preparation that will remove you so you will not experience this wrath of God being poured out upon this world is the gospel message. What we see that points to him crucified, and I'm speaking, of course, concerning Yeshua, him being crucified, his blood being shared, and through the resurrection, we have confirmation of his victory over sin and death. And the reason why he went to that cross was for our forgiveness. He took that judgment. He took that wrath. So if we remove God as a judging God, then the cross becomes in vain. This is why we need to be accurate and speak all of God's counsel. Verse 1, he begins by saying, draw near, and he uses the word goyim, which can be nations or Gentiles. And as frequently is the case, we see that prophecy has poetry. And poetry is, is discerned by its parallelism. So we see the word goyim and the word leumim for nation. And nation, two words that frequently is translated, they are translated the same way, but they have a slightly different meaning. One speaks to the nation, and the other one speaks more to the inhabitants of the nation. So we read in verse 1, draw near, O nations, to hear. This is a word for hearing, which demands a response. And then the parallelism and nations, and this is the nations collectively, listen. And this is a word to hear what is being said. Be able to discern it accurately. And God is very clear in what he's saying. Then he says, hear, O earth and its fullness. And what is parallel to the earth, the world, and all of its, and this last word, oftentimes when it's applied to a person, it means offsprings, those that go forth in the next generation. And here we're talking about the world and everything that, that goes forth out of the world, meaning God, this message is all inclusive. No matter who you are, where you are, and what generation you live in, this has implications for you for all of God's creation. Now look at verse 2. The next thing we're told, for, and it's a word, ketsef, which is a word which speaks about a, a very hostile anger. One that, when it's applied to an animal, that animal is almost out of control. It speaks about and the image here is when an animal gets very, very angry. We say it begins to froth at the mouth. There is physical, discernible signs of this anger. And this same word is, of course, used in regard to God who's always in control. But nevertheless, it's to emphasize his anger. For there is anger or wrath unto the Lord, meaning that belongs to him, concerning all the nations. And, and then it's the word for his hot anger upon all their hosts. Now, the host here, this word, is the simple word for army. But we're going to see when we speak about the host, it can be applied to not simply a literal army, but those things that are powerful, powerful in this world and powerful, as we'll see in a moment, in the heavens. This will be clearer in the next verse. Look at verse, verse 2, the second part. 
he says that the wrath upon their their host and he has and this is a word is used in the torah for a special type of commandment when god would send forth the children of Israel to a people, to a city, and he would say, devote everything unto me. And what he means by that is destroy everything. Take no plunder, take no spoil. None of this can be used for you, but it all needs to be offered up, usually burnt up, consumed totally unto the Lord. And it's very significant that he uses this word. Now, it's a word of destruction. He destroys them, and he gives them over to, and the next word is a word for massacre or a slaughter. So God is using words that are very, very picturesque very clear in their meaning so that we can have an accurately accurate understanding that God is going to bring about a massacre in this world upon humanity and every aspect of his creation that have not surrendered unto him. Verse 3. Now we use two words, again, Hebrew poetry, parallelism, Two words that speak about corpses and the dead. We look at verse 3, and this is a word for a body that is empty. That is a body that is without its soul, so a dead one. And their slain will be stretched out, and their corpses will will go up. And the next word means a, a stench, something of a most foul odor. So we have vivid imagery, very clear. God is going to bring death in his judgment, a physical death, but also a spiritual, eternal torment. So once again, their slain are stretched forth, meaning are cast forth throughout the the earth. And their corpses, they go up in a stench. And the mountains, they melt. And here, the mountains, oftentimes, prophetically, a mountain speaks about a seat of government, an authority. So their mountains, they they melt from their blood. Verse 4. And all the hosts of heavens, they, they decay. And this is a word for rotting away usually, but it means to pass away, dissolve. And most of the scholars, both both rabbinical and Christian, see that this is speaking about the heavenly host, but not the armies, these angels, but rather the sun and the moon and the stars. Almost without exception, in fact, I found no exception among the commentators that we all know how the sun is going to become dark. The moon will not give its light. The stars of the heavens will fall to the ground. And it speaks about cosmic changes. And this is what this verse is speaking about in verse 4. For all the host of heaven, the sun, the moon, and the stars, they will, will pass away. And and the heavens will be rolled up as a book and all their hosts, everything that, that relates to the things in the sky and outer space in creation. And it says, they, literally, it will wither as a withering of a leaf of a vine and as the withering of a fig tree. So God uses terminology, languages, images that was very well known by the people. Verse 5, for, and this is word to be saturated, and it's simply a word that speaks of great abundance. When a war takes place and people fight with the sword, the swords become full of blood dripping with the blood of those who were slain. And this is the imagery here in verse 5. 
4, the, the heavens will become saturated, and it's the heavens speaking about my sword. So my sword from the heavens will be saturated. Behold concerning Edom, and this is Edom, this enemy, this eternal enemy of, of God. Edom, the offspring of Esau, they are going to be consumed because it says that the, the sword of heaven is going to be brought down upon Edom. And upon all, and then it uses the same word for devoted thing. Devoted, not a pious thing, but that which has been devoted, and that means to be consumed. This, this absolutely annihilation. So it's devoted unto God by being ultimately and accurately destroyed. So he says, and concerning the people of my destruction for, and that word at the end of our, our verse, verse 5, is the word for judgment. Now, this brings to the reader an understanding that this is God's retribution. He is bringing this judgment upon the world because of sin, because of rebelliousness. And this is the judgment, what we're studying about, and we'll see this in verse, verse uh, uh, 1 and 2 of the next chapter. This is the judgment that is going to bring about a transformation of God's creation. And what is that transformation? The kingdom of God. Verse 6. He says again, a sword unto the Lord. It is full of blood. It has become fat from the fatness, from the blood of lambs and goats and from the fatness of the kidneys of rams. For, and this is a word for sacrifice, but most see it as a slaughter, as a massacre unto the Lord. Where? In Botsra. And this uh, parallels what we're going to study uh, many months from now when we get into Isaiah chapter 63, where Messiah, and I've shared with you before that there's three primary places that, that Messiah is going to visit in the last days in regard to his second coming, not the rapture, but the second coming. He is going to judge the mountain of Esau in the land of Edom, and we're talking about Botsra. Secondly, he is going to pour out judgment upon all those nations that come up to, to Israel, heading to Jerusalem, to take the city away from the people of God. And we see that there in Armageddon, it's the battle of the war of Gog and Magog. It's going to take place in the valley of Israel, that is Jezreel, and we're going to see that he goes there, and then after, the final place that he's going to come to is the Mount of Olives, as we are told in Acts chapter 1, that he is going to return there and go down the Mount of Olives, cross over the Kidron Valley through the Eastern Gate, and the kingdom of God will soon be established. So here we have judgment upon Basra, and it says that there's going to be a massacre, a great massacre, Tevach Gadol, in the land of Edom. So Edom, Botsra, all those places is where God's going to pour out in a very, very definite way his, his anger and his wrath. Move to verse 7. And, the, and this can be the word for buffalo. It speaks about a large animal, like a buffalo or such, that they are going to come down with them, 
and bulls with the mighty ones, meaning the mighty bulls. And it says once again that their land is going to be saturated from blood and their, their dust from the fatness is going to become fertile. Now, the word fertile is the same word for fatness in this sense. Because of the, the death that's going to take place, the land is going to become fertile. It is going to, when we talk about the fatness of the land. So this judgment is going to bring about a glorious change upon the earth. And what is this glorious change? Obviously, it's the establishment of the millennial kingdom. And as I said, next week when we get into chapter 35, we're going to see, see this great difference between what we're studying now and what will be. In fact, in the last few verses of chapter 34, we begin to turn our attention to this change, to the fact that there's going to be a remnant that's going to inherit this kingdom, this earth that becomes the millennial kingdom. So now verse 8, for it is a day of vengeance unto the Lord. It is the year of recompense, and it's in the plural, and it speaks about an abundant, and this word is a word for payment. So it's a year that God's going to make a payment. It's in the plural, so an abundant payment back upon those who have violated his truth, rebelled against his grace, and have been in defiance against his purposes, his plan. So that's why we see here that it's a day of vengeance unto the Lord. It's a day that God, and look at the end of verse, verse 8, a very important phrase that we, we better not leave out. And that is, and let me read it in Hebrew, where it says, Le Reeve Tzion. Now, reef is a word for conflict. It's a word to contend. So it's going to be the day of vengeance when God contends, when God's in conflict with the world over what? Zion. And again, this is a, another example of how the term Zion or Zion in English relates to the kingdom. All of what's going on, this judgment, this wrath, this great massacre, this slaughter, God uses those words. We must as well. And we look at that, and if we don't have understanding, we just focus in on how bad this is. But it's not bad. It is justice. It is the day of recompense. God is setting things in order. God is establishing righteousness. And as we see the outcome, what he's doing is he's contending in order that Zion, Zion, the kingdom, will be established. God is making here peace by punishing and destroying his enemy. Verse, verse 9. Here's another two words that, that also point to and in time wrath, that this is the proper interpretation because we have the word for, for brimstone and sulfur. And oftentimes this brimstone or sulfur is also related to in the Old Testament, a, a pouring out of, of God's judgment, his hot wrath. And it uses a word that we would translate as, as tar, speaking about simply that which has uh, uh, you get tar on your car, it's, it's not pleasant, not a purposeful thing for human uh, uh, life. Now, we pave roads with it, but for the most part, other than that, it has no purpose. So he says here that he is going to take the earth's rivers and turn them into to tar, and the dirt, the, the land, he says, 
is going to become for sulfur. And it shall be that the land, it is going to be tar for burning. So everything that the world emphasized, what the world was seeking, what the world wanted and pursued, it is going to become nothing more than than sulfur and brimstone and tar, that which is not of value for us. It's not going to be something that is good. Now, in the end, God's going to transform it into that which is good for his people. But we're going to see an image and what the prophet is doing is saying what the world worked for, what the world sought for, what the world lie, stole, and deceived to achieve and receive. All of that is going to turn into that which no one wants. But in the end, God's going to do a great thing. Look at verse 10. Night and day, speaking about the earth, and this is the place of his judgment. This is, most scholars see it referring to the place outside the kingdom, where there's outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he says here concerning this place of judgment, look at verse 10, day and night it will not be extinguished. Forever will go up its smoke from generation to generation. It will be destroyed forever and ever. And no one will pass in it, meaning no one will want to go there. Now, the image of this last part of this verse is when something is good, when there's a place that that is a nice place, a good place, people want to travel there, they want to visit, they pass through there, they come. But when it's a place that that is of no worthiness, nothing there, a place that is a recipient of God's wrath and his judgment, his vengeance, no one will want to pass through it. Now he uses some symbolic language. He says that there are going to be those that inherit it, those that who are going to dwell there. And he speaks about one type, and all of these animals are unkosher. That is, they are rejectable. They are not uh, received by humanity. They are, are rejected, and it uses a term. Now, we really don't know what this this term is, what it's referring to other than a type of bird or animal that is unclean. And with that is the porcupine and the owl and the raven. These type of, of animals, unclean, they will dwell in it. And I will stretch forth unto it a, a line. Now, there's a line and a few words here for building. They are tools of the surveyor to put things in order. But there's a play on words. Now, most of you know the term tohu vevohu. It's used in the book of Genesis to describe creation in its original form where it was empty, void, and lacked order. And it wasn't until the Spirit of God and the Word of God began to move and function and be spoken. Then things became good, very good, in the order of God. And what we're reading here in verse verse 11 at the end, it says he's going to stretch out a line of tohu, and he's going to place rocks of Vohu. Now, these lines and rocks were markers. They were were there for the purpose of building upon it. And what he's saying is this place is going to be a place of, of confusion. It will not lack order. It is going to represent a place that is devoid of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Verse verse 12. Now he's going to speak about the, the, the great ones, the noble ones 
of this world. And he's using that in the ones who were the political leaders, that they had clout, they had power, they had authority, but they were not submissive to God. They did not use their position for the things of God. And it says it's noblemen. There's not going to be any kingdom. This is going to be proclaimed that there's no kingdom for its noblemen and all of its officials, and these would be high officials. It says they are going to be, and the word here is afis. Afis is the word for zero, nothing. There's going to be nothing in their account. Everything that they have achieved, all their, their glory in this world, being a ruler, a high official, assuming a position of authority and honor from the world's perspective in the end, it brings about nothing whatsoever before God. Verse 13, it says, it's palaces. It will go up in these palaces, thorns and thistles and briars. They will be also in your fortresses and that they will be a, a place. Now, it's in the singular, it will be, referring to the whole place collectively, it will be a, a dwelling place for, for jackals. Its courtyards will be given over to ostriches. And here again, these animals are all unclean. They, they do not have a purpose for blessing individuals, humanity. So God is using symbolic language saying, this place is unclean. This place is not a place of purpose. This place, in the same way that these type of animals were rejected, this is a place that's rejected by God. Verse 14. And we'll meet, and again he uses words, and the word tziyim and iyim. There's a couple different translations of this, and it's only through parallelism that we can arrive at the proper one. We're speaking about animals, two types of animals, desert animals and animals that perhaps uh, uh, dwell in more of a tropic in an island atmosphere. But regardless, he says that that. That will be a meeting place for these type of animals. For the goat concerning its mate, and it will call. And it says, and, and there will be a, a place of, of relaxation for the night creatures, for it will be found for her there rest. So all of these things that are rejected, these things that are seen as a, a creature of abomination, one that is not uh, associated with humanity or has a purpose for humanity, these things are being placed there. Again, it's symbolic, saying that the things that are there were not for the blessings of man that did not have a purpose for the life of man. All of these things are rejected. Verse 15. And there we're going to find that, that uh, the serpent will, will make a nest. And, and this serpent, she will, will lay her eggs. She will hatch them. And she will gather them up, meaning her chicks, under her shadow. But there they will gather the, the unclean fowls, uh, her and her mate. So it's simply saying that, again, it's a place for that which is, is not what man seeks, not what humanity finds value in, not something that is used or a blessing for him. Verse 16. Now we're talking about a 
transition in verse 16. Verse 16 sets the the stage for what we're going to study next week in Isaiah 35. It says, seek. And it says, seek from the word, the book of the Lord. And be read, meaning call upon the word of the Lord. Utilize the word of the Lord. So it says, not one from it, not one from it, most scholars, not one promise, not one word from it is going to be absent, meaning everything that God says is going to be fulfilled. And this is the third time a woman and her mate will not be missing. So we find here that God is going to turn based upon his promises that he is going to work with the family. It emphasizes that in the same way that that God saw and provided for those things that were not, not acceptable, God is going to provide for those who are acceptable, those who base their life upon the revelation of the word of God. So seek from the word of the Lord. And read, and what's going to be the outcome? Not one thing from it is going to be missing. A woman and her mate will not lack. For the mouth, and it's the mouth of the Lord, presumably, he has commanded, and his spirit is gathering. So what we find here is this. In the midst of God's wrath being poured out, those who have sought the revelation of God, those who, both her and her mate, are going to be gathered up. They're not going to be missing. They're not going to be lacking anything. And we find, last verse, verse 17, for he will cast upon them the goral. Goral is a lot. And it's also speaking about a future. See, those who have no covenant relationship with God, they have no future. Their lot is going to be on the outside, where there's darkness, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. But God is going to gather up He is going to fulfill their lot, what he has promised them. And his hand is going to divide it out to them. And it's going to be, and then we have that same word for a line. It is going to be prepared. It is going to be be stretched out according to the right measurement. And it says, unto ever, ad olam, forever and ever. They will inherit it, and for generation and generation, they will dwell in it. And who is that? Well, this is the ones that God is going to place in his kingdom. They are going to dwell there, and in chapter 35, we see what those who are going to be in the kingdom of God, what they can expect. Chapter 35 is a chapter of encouragement. It speaks about a glorious change that is coming. And this glorious change is the kingdom of God. So until next week, when we begin this 35th chapter, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.